Hello guys, how are you? Welcome back to the Hippier Podcast. <laughs> also known as Uncomfortable Truths. Da, 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 da. That should be my theme intro. I'm not gonna lie, because it's really, because I shed really uncomfortable stuff on here. But I do it in like, cutesy patootsy manner, you know? To make it like, less hard to absorb. <laughs> anyway, if you're new here, I really, I don't know what this is either. But I'm just happy to be here. Uh, but no, this is a place where I literally just talk, you know, about the Islamic perspective for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Because, like, we can all just learn a little something about anything at this point, you know? Uh, and guys, don't forget, this is also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and all the podcast platforms ever. Okay, without further ado, let's get started. So today I want to talk about dua. Dua. This is a big, big, big topic in Islam. This is not like one of those things that like you brush on, you 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 brush past, and like you're like, ah, I'll think about that later. This is, I'm not gonna say like a pillar of Islam. It's not, but it's very neglected. It's very neglected, and it's very, mm, it's not given enough attention at all. I don't think by today's generation of Muslims, it's not. It's not being taken advantage of at all. Okay, me included, guys. I mean, if I take an insult and a hit on you, I am simultaneously doing it on myself. So, calm down, guys. Um, dua for those who don't know, for the non-Muslims, is basically kind of like an act of supplication and invocation to Allah in order to get something that we want so in in a way in a way in a way you could say it's manifestation okay Uh, now i'm not relating it to the manifestation of like the yoga world where you know i attract and the universe will give it to me um that is a big no-no in our religion okay we don't do we don't do that we, well, we do ask, but we don't ask the universe. We ask Allah. We ask our creator, our sustainer, the one who created us, okay? So there's a big difference on that front. Um, so it is basically the essence of manifestation, but like it's just it's, it's channeling all of that energy to Allah, to just one entity. Not like this broad concept of the universe. Okay, so let's start off by defining what dua is. Now, the most uh, associated words with dua is supplication and invocation. Supplication in terms of pleading and begging, like you supplicate. And invocation in terms of invoking, you know, calling upon. Actually, the root word of, the root essence of the word dua in Arabic is to invoke, is to, is to summon. Dua is a form of asking. You are asking the king of kings, right? Allah. But asking is not, I don't think encapsulates the whole meaning because, because when you're asking someone, like when you're invoking them and you're pleading and begging, basically all of your dignity is just not there when you're, supplicating that person or or that entity astaghfirullah in this case it's not a person right but it's like you you don't have shame if that makes sense like you are going to cry you're going to bawl your eyes out you're going to look ugly okay supplicating to the most high because there's like there's no sense of ego involved like you are you're truly just giving it your all you know and that's why the whole essence and form of dua is like attesting to the fact and the idea that we are Muslims, a part of Islam. Because what does Islam mean? It means submission. We're submitting our entire selves to Allah. So when we're making dua, it's a form of submitting. You know, we're submitting wholeheartedly to Allah because we're telling Him every single thing that we want. And we're not holding back, and there's no shame, and we're not shy. We just, we say everything that is in our hearts. So that's why this, I think, is a big part of Islam, because 
in a way when you're making dua when you're calling upon Allah and asking for every single thing that you want in turn it's like you're saying Allah you are the most high Allah you are the most powerful Allah you are the most knowing Allah you are you are capable of anything and everything that's why I'm asking you you know so in a way when you're making dua that's why it's a form of worship because you're acknowledging that Allah is capable of anything the creator of the universe and everything inside it and the heavens and the earth is capable of everything so that's why dua is a very essential part of our lives and not only does it serve Allah in that way and attesting to the fact that he's capable of everything but in turn we get help in turn we get something in return like we actually benefit from it you know and i'm going to talk later about how it might not be in this world it might be in the next life that's a different topic right now but we have nothing to lose when we're making dua and i think in this generation specifically there is a lack of dua or we don't make that much dua we don't ask allah enough because of our sense of ego um not because we think we're better than that but because we think well no actually to some degree we some people okay and i used to be like not really invested in dot because i was like what's the point like i'm just gonna do what i have to do and there's no reason to call help for everything you know like but then you realize you're asking the one who is also at the same time keeping your blood moving keeping your heart pumping keeping your lungs working keeping your brain firing every he's all of these things are working because of him so what makes you think that you can do the other things without asking him does that make sense it's like it's a form of really letting go of ego and understanding that you're not as strong as you think you are and we really think like we're we have this complex of we are capable of doing whatever we want to do and there is no limit to what we can do and i think at some point people forgot to put a cap on that like no but at the end of the day we're humans and literally one mosquito bite can send us to the grave it it's you have to come to terms with the fact that you're a human being very fallible going back to the idea of islam of submitting ourselves to allah when we are making dua that is a gift given to us by allah because we are asking and we're conversing with the one who knows everything the one who is most merciful the one who is the most powerful the all encompassing we are, we are in connection with the one who who is in charge of everything basically like imagine having direct access to that and being like no it's okay i can do it on my own no need <laughs> i could do this on my own i don't need any help guys Wallah, you are not taking advantage. I'm just saying, I'm just throwing that out there, okay? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So before I delve deep into how to make da'at, because I think that's like the juice of this video, that's the butter, the bread and butter, I'm actually going to put a timestamp for anyone who's just interested in that. But there's also a lot of points that I think are worth mentioning about uh, da'at and the psychology behind it and how people who use da'at are in a way, okay, in a way, are mentally healthier than those who don't. Because I think there's a strong, strong correlation there. And you know, I always like to see how um, the research world and Islam kind of come together. And Islam kind of fills in the gaps for research in some cases, in most cases. But because like, when you put Muslims under the microscope, you see insane out of this world things you see patterns that are not normal because what they have in their brain what they're trying to contain in their brain and their being and their entire lives is allah and allah is all encompassing allah is like nothing no one not a single cell would be here if it wasn't for allah so imagine trying to or attempting to keep that entity in your brain for all your life your brain chemistry is not going to be the same because allah is in your brain and when allah is in your brain it's like 
anything can happen and it's okay because Allah is in your brain. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to talk about this research paper. <laughs> I really do need to stop talking. Okay, starting off strong, we got this guy called Alport. Gordon Alport, an American psychologist. I have so much mercy for American psychologists. Because, like, there's psychologists and then there's, like, American psychologists, okay? Because I believe American psychologists are studying something completely different, okay? From this entire world, just completely... But that's not the point of this video. That's not. Even though I really, I feel very strongly about this. Um, but anyway, he uh, he's known for his study in personality. And he has this theory where personality comes in chunks. He wrote this paper about the different kinds of religious people, which I found really interesting. He talks about the extrinsically motivated religious people and the intrinsically... Wait motivated religious people okay yeah i'm working on two brain cells right now you guys are so lucky i am able to form sentences and one interesting thing he noted and i see this a lot is intrinsic people are serving themselves for religion whereas extrinsically oriented people are seeing how religion serves them intrinsic people use religion as this fundamental foundation for their life choices and decisions. They make every decision in life with a reason, with a reason going back to this foundation that is built and set for the rest of their lives. Because what do they believe their religion to be? The truth. And so when you are exposed to the truth, you're not going to basically drop it and leave. You're going to use that and base your life on those set of truths. Whereas extrinsic people don't really care if that's the truth. <laughs> they don't. They use religion more so for power, to, to have access to certain things, to be in certain positions. You can see this heavily embedded in history. Like, all, like in all of history, men used religion to basically have control over a population. And that's why people say, is religion used for power or is religion used to control the people that's like a, a certain you know rhetoric that is always used when talking about religion but like that's a different scope of religion one specific time in history which all muslims know is the quraish the quraish with rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam the in the time of the, our prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was in this place in this time of history in a society where you only had power in the government where to have power and to reach a certain position in government you just have to basically follow what everyone else is following and at that time there was a lot of idolatry like you would associate a lot of different idols with allah and that, that was basically their way of thinking that was there was like a god for sustenance there was like a god for uh, rain there was like a god for food and uh, crops and whatever it was that was their way of thinking so if you wanted to reach a certain position you had to basically outwardly say you believe what they believe it was a very herd mentality like environment and so you can imagine how someone like the prophet وسلم, came and he was so not convinced by this he he would usually spend his time in the cave really really far away from the people because it was like this is respectfully dumb disrespectfully actually he well he didn't stuff Allah, he didn't say that but i would assume if he was stuff Allah, stuff Allah. I, I shouldn't joke about this stuff but like it's just like saying that it, it was a very very extrinsically motivated environment yeah and you know even people in Quraysh at that time were not convinced some people were not convinced like deep down they knew this is a bunch of bullcrap but like they just they did it because they wanted the power, they were greedy, they wanted money, they wanted status, whatever it is, but like, there is something they wanted. Like, how does this religion serve me? Now, there's another study that I wanted to focus on, and it's by Janaya, 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 Janaya and Shaw. Mm. That further based their study on Alport's theory of this 
categorization of religious people, the intrinsically and extrinsically motivated. And the theory is that intrinsically motivated people lead healthier lives. Their mental health is better. They are more in tune with themselves and they don't have these inner conflicts and what's that word? I spent five minutes trying to find the words cognitive dissonance. No, cognitive dissonance. That's what I was trying to get at. Extrinsically motivated people have a lot of cognitive dissonance because their outside is not really matching their inside. Okay. There's a dissonance. They're cognitively dissonant at all times. Okay, most times. And intrinsically motivated people are very aligned. They're very in tune. Their inside radiates to the outside. Like they cannot... There's no outside going inward. It's only inward going outward. And so I wanted to go back to the paper, the, the one by Jania, 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 I swear this name is going to send me to the grave. Jania and Shaw, whatever their names are pronounced like. Their main variable of concern is depression. Depression alongside these set of people, the different people that are intrinsically motivated, extrinsically motivated, and two other groups of people that are interesting, pro-religion and anti or non-religion or non-religious. Alport, the one I mentioned before, the American psychologist, describes pro-religious people as believing all religion to be good, all types of religion to be good. Anti slash non-religious people inherently disagree with religion. It's not like they have a personal vendetta against it, like, I am going to live to make sure that no religion exists on the face of the planet. No, it's more like, I just don't associate with it. You know, like, I don't, no thank you, you know? So now that we have these four people defined, we have the intrinsically motivated, people who serve themselves for religion, the extrinsically motivated, people who use religion to serve them, and the pro-religious who believe that all religion is good, and the anti-religious to believe that no religion is good. Basically, in essence, the opposite of pro-religious. Now, they measured depression alongside these different categories, these four different categories. And honestly, the results were very interesting. They're very interesting. The way they measured depression was by using this scoring system called the Bex Depression Inventory, which is like a questionnaire that has 21 questions. And I'll link it in the description in the YouTube video. And honestly, have a go at it. It's really interesting. It, it questions the person's inside a lot, like how they feel about certain situations and their reactions to said situations. And that's basically the common theme of all of this. Like depression is the sense of helplessness. You're helpless. There's this void. There's this black hole. You don't know if there's an end to it. You don't know if there's a way out you know and you'll see with an intrinsically motivated religious people that that isn't the case i'm not saying that depression doesn't exist with intrinsically motivated people but it's seldom that that's where they end up and are left for the rest of eternity there is a way out for them and they know it now having said all of that i want to tie this study with what I was talking about previously in the beginning of this video. Now, this shows us that intrinsically motivated people score way lower on depression levels compared to, you know, the extrinsically motivated, the pro-religious and non-religious. Now, that's not to say that it, intrinsically motivated people do not experience depression. That is nowhere near what I'm saying. In fact, our own prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had a year of depression and sorrow you know after his own uncle and wife died he was in despair he was in absolute despair like his uncle was like his own father because his father died a long time ago so it's like while he was getting revelation from the most high the most exalted he still felt sad he still felt i wouldn't know if it was some kind of depression but he didn't feel good you know it's not to say that intrinsically motivated people 
feel good all the time but like it's okay to experience these lows in fact it's a part of life and it's a part of our test as muslims allah says وَلِنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَاتٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمْ الْمُهْتَدُونَ Allah says we're going to test you with hunger and fear and and losses of money and lives and and you know food in general so tell those who are patient because it comes with patience to endure these things that's why our religion is equipped with so many things to grant us patience in times of hardship to to grant us ease in times of hardship we're equipped with so many things and one of those things is dua one of the most neglected aspects is dua like we have access to this gold mine this treasure and we're acting like it's an optional thing you know like i'll do that when you know the tough gets going well i'll do that when all else fails i'll do that when every possible outlet is exhausted and that is the last resort so it's like you need to understand how heavy this weighs how heavy first of all it weighs that you have not taken advantage of it and how much it weighs when you start doing it because wallahi the difference between yani what could be hell and heaven is dua subhanallah can you imagine isn't that absolutely mind blowing and that is for eternity that's not a simple thing going back to what i was saying i don't even know how many tangents i went into yeah so i wanted to use this idea of intrinsically motivated people being relatively less depressed than their peers okay to to supply the fact that islam in and of itself is entirely intrinsically motivated because islam is submission submission you are submitting yourself to allah i talked about that in the beginning now intrinsically motivated people as alport defined are people who serve themselves for religion they basically give themselves away it's like their bodies their personalities their ideas it doesn't really mean anything in the face of religion in the face of islam in the face of allah it doesn't mean anything and by doing so by submitting yourself fully you are mentally healthier that's the connection i'm trying to make they're saying that intrinsically motivated people are mentally better they're mentally more at ease at peace you are better off submitting yourself because at the end of the day you don't even know what the next millisecond has in store for you so by by having that mindset by knowing that you don't even know and that you are just basically part of the whole picture it really puts you at ease and in turn that makes you mentally healthier to function as the everyday human being and right now when you're seeing everything that's going on in Palestine on social media wallahi if there if you are not intrinsically motivated and you're seeing every single thing unfold it's like you you lose yourself you can actually lose yourself because when you see all of the martyrs you know what's going to happen after that you know the repercussions of that in this world and in the hereafter you know that something is going to happen you know that's not going to happen for the sake of just happening being intrinsically motivated and seeing all of these things unfold you know that you have access to the most high the most merciful the all encompassing allah says ad'uni astajib lakum ask me i will give you that's a promise allah said that in the quran ask me i will give you so who do you think you are to say that is he really you have this doubt that allah is not going to answer you have this doubt like yeah but if i make a dua is allah really going to hear me like he's up there somewhere up there and i'm like way down here is he really going to listen to me there's all of these other muslims around me much better muslims you know they are a lot closer to allah he's definitely going to hear them but is he going to hear me like why me why would he listen to me 
Why would he have to care about what I want and what I want to say and what I want in life? And this doubt, this doubt is so normal. This doubt is from Shaitan. None other than Shaitan. Shaitan Rajim, you guys. He's working hard. He's working endlessly hard to make you think that your da is like maybe gonna get there. Maybe it's gonna get a little lost in translation, but maybe it's gonna get there. Like we don't know for sure. Might as well. Like people say make da. Okay, I guess I'll make da. Like I, I don't know really what I want to wish for, what I want to ask for, but maybe, maybe I'll get heard. You see this idea of maybe, this idea of like. It might be. It might not be. This is shaitan. And and it's only when you are in that state, you you can't really recognize it. But when you're out of it, you can semi-recognize it. You, you can at least acknowledge that, okay, that is not a sign of strong faith. That is not a sign of strong iman. Because the believer, the mu'min who makes dua to Allah, he makes it with absolute certainty. Because why? Because Allah said, Ad'uni astajib lakum. The believer knows with absolute certainty. Allah said, ask me and I will give you. Okay, I'm going to ask Allah and I know for a fact Allah is going to give me. Maybe not in this dunya, maybe in the hereafter. And maybe not even in this dunya because if that door opens for me, then it was not good for me. And in fact, when it comes to the day of judgment, when you see everything that you asked for in this dunya, you didn't get and you get to see everything that you asked for. You're going to wish that you got nothing in this dunya. You're going to wish that none of what you asked for came true in this dunya. And then it was all stored for you in the day, in the hereafter, on the day of judgment. Because you're going to want something to show. I talk about that all the time. You're going to want something to show for Allah. You want to have something for Allah. And so to have all of these things that you wanted and that you remained patient for, but you never got here... Over there, you're going to get it and it's going to be insurmountably better. It's going to be better on a level you don't understand. You're going to wish that you had nothing here. That's why a believer, when they make dua, they don't make dua because they want the thing to come true so badly. They make dua because they want this thing. However badly they want it, they want this thing. And they're going to Allah and they're asking Allah, Allah, I want this thing. So you're you're coming with humility. You're letting your ego go. You're letting what yourself wants. And you're going to Allah and you're saying, Allah, I want this thing. Of course, granted that this thing is not sinful, of a sinful nature. Or it's not going to hurt kinship ties. Or that it's not going to hurt anybody. That's what, you know, the halal dua is. Allah, I want this thing that's, you know, that's halal. But like the believer isn't like, Allah, I want this thing and this thing, no. It's like, that's it. The believer goes to Allah and says, Allah, I want this thing. And I'm happy if you give it to me. And I'm happy if you don't give it to me. Because the believer knows that this dunya is nothing. Like, this is like, this is only not even like a fragment of what we're going through, you know? But I didn't even continue the ayah. Let's continue the ayah. Allah says, وَقَالَ رَبَّكُمْ أَدْعُونِ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Allah said, Invoke me and I will answer you. Ask me and I will answer. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمْ دَاخِرِينَ Those who are too proud to worship me, who are too proud and on their high pedestal to serve me, for them is hell. Hell. Humiliated. They're going to be humiliated. Because you're actively knowing that Allah is the most high, the most encompassing, the all-powerful, knows everything, is capable of everything. There's no end to Allah and His capabilities and everything that Allah is. There's no end. Allah is infinite. Allah, even the word infinite doesn't even begin to explain how infinite Allah is. And so for a person, especially a mu'min, or not even a mu'min, a Muslim, the so-called Muslim, to come and say, I'm not going to ask Allah because I feel like, I don't know, I could do it on my own. 
you know it's like i don't know it's just i don't need a lot in this you know and, and they don't tie a lot back to everything that they do in life like in this why should i ask a lot like i can i can do it you know and Allah didn't even say in asking me. Allah said by wor in worshipping me. The ones who are too proud to worship me. Because, you know, dua is a form of worship. When you're asking Allah, you are acknowledging that Allah is the most powerful. So in turn, that is a form of worship. And you're getting benefit in return. And this goes back to an idea that I wanted to mention. And it's that when you're making dua to Allah, you know, as I said, you're acknowledging that Allah is the most high. But like, don't be shy with your dua. People hold back. People, some people I see, they're like, no, if I pray for this, like, like this is a big, big thing. And I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I shouldn't pray for it. Like this is far-fetched. This is out of this world far-fetched and just not, like this would happen by a miracle. I don't know if I want to ask Allah that. And again, that's shaitan as usual, but... The beautiful thing about da'a is there is no end. There is no cap as to what you can pray for. There is no cap on what you can ask for. Even if you're asking for the most far-fetched, outrageous thing, that again is within the halal bounds, that you, you don't hold back. When you ask Allah for Jannah, you ask for Jannah al-Fadaws al-A'la. You don't ask for Jannah and then cap it off there. Like, Allah, I just want to enter Jannah. That's it. No. Even if you know you're not the best, you're going to ask Allah, Allah, I want Jannah to fadus al-A'la. I want to be next to you. Because Allah said, ask me, I will give you. So you're like really thinking that Allah won't give you that? The one who calls himself of Ahman of Ahim, the most merciful, the most gracious, Allah is not going to give you what you asked for and he promised you that? And you're holding back? Why are you holding back? I get that you think you're not the best and you don't deserve it. But Allah is more merciful on you than you on your own selves. Allah wants more for you than what you want for your own self. So ask Allah more than what you think you deserve. Even if you know you're not doing the best that you can be doing. Still ask Allah. Because Allah is going to answer one way or another. It's not like you ask Allah and then Allah says, mm, I don't know, you don't deserve it. No, if you're, say, if you're asking sincerely, if you're speaking from the absolute heart, if you're coming to Allah with full humility and you left every single bit of ego behind, and you're asking Allah, Allah, I know, I'm not the best Muslim, but I want Jannah al Fadaws al A'la. You don't know what you can get when you ask that. You don't. You don't understand the extent to which you can reach when you ask things like this, because it's a big thing. It's bigger than you ever imagined. So don't hold back. Don't think like. I don't know. Like maybe. I'm just not good enough for that. Or I'm not the best Muslim to be asking that specifically. You know, and I actually wanted to show you guys something that I wrote last Ramadan. Last Ramadan, I made a list of adaya that I wanted, things that I wanted badly. And I wasn't a good Muslim. Not as much. Not as much as I wanted to be. I was actually not doing a lot. I really wasn't. But I'll show you guys some of the things that I wrote and that I prayed for. I said... Start podcasts with episodes focused on helping Muslims. I made that dua. I made that dua when I was so uncomfortable with even uttering the word Muslim on my social media. I made that dua when I was so not that connected with Allah. And I was only beginning to see that this dunya was not worth being heedless with and so i asked allah allah i want to help more muslims i want to help myself first and then i want to help more muslims and i made so many other adaya like this like allow people who have troubles in islam to approach me and inspire muslims to do more than their practices and allow me to turn back to allah for the slightest inconvenience and lessen my listening to music or at least music that's dealing with the bad 
this is I wrote this at a time when music encompassed my life. Music absolutely encompassed my life. And when I read this back, which was today, I read this back today, I found it out of the blue. I saw less in my listening to music. Little does my past self know that I cut music. And if I went back to the past and I told myself, Farah, you cut music, I would not, I would not believe myself. I'd be like, nah, you're joking. <laughs> you're jo- like, what do you listen to the gym? You're joking, right? You know, by the way, I don't listen to anything at the gym. I just, bare ears, you know, but when you make dua, Allah said, I'm going to answer you. So what's holding you back from making dua? I don't understand. What is it that people think they're not good enough for? Because when you're making da'a for Allah, for anything, Palestine, for your education, for your marriage, for whatever it is, especially when you're making da'a to go back to Allah, that's like, that's like the biggest gift from Allah. That's Allah's giving you Islam with his hands in a way that is befitting to Allah. So if you have not made dua for your iman to be strengthened and for you to be more on the straight path and to be closer to Allah, to read more Quran, to remind people of Islam, to be a person that is just Muslim as a whole, what are you doing? And I'm talking about sincere dua and dua that is from the heart. Because when you realize that this dunya is just a test and that the afterlife is the real life, you know that you have to make dua for that. You know. You know because you know this is basically all kind of a lie and a facade. Because a lot of people put a lot of flashy things in front of your eyes like, Oh, but you can have this lifestyle. You can have this. You can do this. You can be that. But you know it's all a facade. You know that none of that actually matters. Like, it's it's all just for show. And in the end, if you actually do pursue that and you indulge in that, you're not going to be happy. You're going to be actually, you're going to be very troubled on the inside. So make dua. Make dua. Well, that's the best thing you can do ever. It actually, it hurts me how little people make dua. And make dua for the small and the big. Make dua for literally the tiniest things like, Oh Allah, I hope I hope I get enough protein in today. I make that dot sometimes because sometimes I swear I slack on my protein. And then make dua for the biggest things like Allah, I want Jannah to for the dose al ala. When you ask Allah in every single thing, the more you ask Allah, the more it's like you're saying that Allah, Allah, you are capable of anything and everything. Allah, you are the one that sustains me. And I'm nothing without you. The more you make da, the more you are implicitly saying that. So the more da, the better always. And I want to go back to a dua. And I think the biggest dua, if I, if I'll be honest. One of the biggest dua that was ever made in history. Uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. Our father Abraham made the biggest dua that changed the course of history obviously by the will of Allah it was mentioned in surah al-baqarah that abraham alayhi salam made this dua rabbana wab'ath fihum rasulan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatika wa ya'allimuhum al-kitab wal hikmata wa yuzakkihim innaka anta al-aziz al-hakim o lord send amongst them a messenger of their own who shall recite unto them your verses and instruct them in your book and purify them Verily, you are the mighty, the wise. Now, this da is not a normal da. Abraham basically said to Allah, Allah, send a messenger for the world. This is not a small request. This is not a small little teensy eensy thing. Allah, send a man who is going to basically spread and teach your book to everyone. The mankind and the jinn. للعالمين. Everyone. That's not a that's not a small dua, guys. Okay, <laughs> you, try to try to wrap your head around that. That's not a small dua, because this dua was made about four thousand years ago, when Abraham 
was alive and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa was here 800 years ago so this du'a was answered oh gosh I'm gonna have to do math now it was answered after 3,200 years can you I, I can't imagine that 3,200 years imagine a person making du'a and it comes true 3,200 years later that's not normal but that also shows how Allah never never loses anything Allah keeps track of every single thing Allah is the most subtle Allah is very subtle by the way that's one of his attributes is that Allah is the most subtle he takes he takes everything that everyone says and everyone asks and he keeps track of them all the time because Allah is the most subtle Allah knows what is in every single heart and Allah kept that for 3,200 years in our eyes that's wow what a massive distance in time but to Allah it's just just 3,200 years that's nothing And I myself right now, I'm like having a little panic attack because that's insane to me. But look at a dua made by Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Allah listened and delivered. And we had our beautiful, amazing, incredible Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he is the reason that we are Muslims today because without him, there would have never been a person to be courageous enough to tell people the truth brave enough to say what people don't want to hear and to fight the people who are distorting the truth who are basically leading the world into utter corruption Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the reason we're on the straight path right now so if it was not for that dua that was made 4,000 years ago who knows what could have happened I'm not saying this would have happened but Really, who knows what could have happened? It's actually insane to think about. This is just to emphasize how strong du'a is. Like I said before, du'a can be the difference between you entering heaven or hell. That's not a normal thing. Du'a is so... Wow! It's incredible! And we're treating it like it's optional. Ah, oh, gosh, I cannot contain myself right now. Um, I wanted to go over really quickly how to make da'a. You know, the etiquette of making da'a. This is literally the reason I made this video. So, astaghfirullah, I just, I could not fathom what I just said. So, there are five steps. Some of them are optional to making da'a. But, you know, it, it's nice to follow the sunnah and just do everything that you can to ensure that your da'a is in the most beautiful form to Allah. You want to ask Allah in the most beautiful form. You don't want to ask Allah a little with one foot out the door and just not sure, you know? You want to ask Allah in the most beautiful state. So first of all is to perform wudu. Now this is not compulsory. You don't have to do it. But that it is good to be in a purified state before you talk with Allah. Just like we make wudu or ablution before praying because we're going to basically converse with Allah. We make wudu when we're going to sit down and we're going to pray to Allah. We're going to ask Allah. You know, we're going to be in a purified state. The second thing, also not obligatory, is to face the Qibla. Now, this could be, you know, after you're finished praying, you just, you stay on your sajada facing the Qibla. You know, because you're facing the Kaaba, you're facing to the most holy site. It's just better to be in that state you're increasing the beauty of your state when you're in wudu you're facing the qibla even you're in your prayer gown or your and your prayer clothes that are suitable for allah when you're asking allah you want to be in like in good form you don't want to ask allah in, in like you can but like it's not it's not really like i wouldn't say that respectful to like ask allah in your pajamas I don't know how to explain it. You can, obviously. When you go to meet the president or the king of a country, are you going to show up in your pajamas? Be honest. No, you're not. 
So why would you do that for Allah? The king of kings. It doesn't make sense. Guys, I'm not shaming those who wear pajamas. I'm just saying. <laughs> you can still do that. <laughs> you could still wear pajamas and make du'a. I'm just saying if you want like more concentrated du'a, you know, like a, a more intense session of du'a where you're asking Allah, be in a better form, be in a better state. And then the third thing, and this is one of my favorite things, this always touches my heart, is to raise your hands. To basically clasp them like this. Put your hands together, almost like forming a bowl. It's kind of like a bowl, like you're going to pour water onto your hands. And you face them upward, like this. We raise our hands, and then we pray for whatever we want to pray for. The thing is, there's this hadith that when we raise our hands like this, clasped and upward, raising to the sky, and we're pleading to Allah, Allah is shy and will not make you return with nothing. Allah is not going to put nothing if you're doing that. He's shy. Allah gets shy when you put your hands like this and you're asking. Allah is like, I'm not going to let that believer return to this world with nothing in their hands. I'm going to put something in their hands. And that gets me emotional sometimes because it's like, Allah, Allah is shy to put... What? What? I don't know, it's just to me that's something like, something that I can't, I don't know, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm enamored right now, you know, I don't even know what to say. The fourth thing, and I think this ties back to this uh, intrinsically motivated form of worship, and it's to make dua in a low voice. You know, you don't make dua when you're screaming or you're, you're doing it in a loud semi-obnoxious stay like Allah I want this and that when you're doing it in a low voice you're also attesting to the fact that even if you whisper your dua Allah the most high is able to hear what you want to say because he is a sami al alim the all hearing the all knowing he can hear you even if you whisper and you know there's also this idea that when we make sujood and we're saying that's like that's considered like the loudest voice in the heavens whereas in this world it's like the the softest most subtle voice you know so when we're praying and we're making dot in the subtle voice you don't know how loud it is in the heavens but that it's out of modesty and respect that we keep our voices and tone a little bit low and it's also because we know that Allah can hear us. Who is Samir al Alim? He can hear us. Now I covered all of the physical stuff. So it's to make wudu, which is not obligatory, to face the Qibla, which is also not obligatory. And you raise your hands, clasped like this, and you make dua in a low tone. Those are four physical things. Now, going on to the next thing is what should you even say? Now, first of all, I need to clear one misconception that's very widespread, and it's that, do I have to make dua in Arabic? No. No. You make dua in your own language. You make dua in whatever you are comfortable speaking in. Allah has no barriers. Like, like Allah doesn't say, no, I will only accept Arabic dua. <laughs> like, that's not... <laughs> that doesn't make sense. You think about it, that doesn't make sense. Because Allah gave Islam for any and everybody of this world and Allah knows we're all different in terms of culture and language and everything else of course Allah is going to know all languages what? is that even a question? Allah wants you to make dua in your most comfortable language because he doesn't want you to hold back he doesn't want you to shy away and think that you have to memorize a specific set of dua you know in Arabic to please Allah of course that's not a bad thing you know you can do that but then when you're making that sincerely from the heart make it in your own language guys I don't know who told you it has to be in Arabic make it in your own language okay that's that helps you to get everything out of your system don't be shy make it in your own language after having cleared that misconception how do you start that the etiquette, the basic etiquette of da'a is that you have to start it with praise. 
Now, when we're praising Allah, we're praising Allah how He praises Himself in the Quran. You know, how Allah says, Subhana, we say, Subhanallah. We say, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, Subhana, can you kuntum nadhalameen? We're praising Allah, yani we're just glorifying Allah to no end. You know, and there's just, you repeat these over and over and over. It's a beautiful way to start because you are basically trying to give Allah his due praise before asking what you want. And obviously, no praise is ever enough for Allah because Allah, you know, you know like we're we're human we can't say things an infinite amount of times and that's not even what allah deserves allah deserves more than infinity of infinity something that is insurmountable to us but though we try we praise allah what before we start and then after you finish praising allah says after you finish praising you call allah by his beautiful names asma allah al-husna all of the good gracious names of Allah and there are so many names of Allah Allah has 99 names but he also has different attributes that are not within those 99 names and some examples are the Ghafur Rahim the great forgiver oh Allah forgive me you are the great forgiver or Al Karim the most generous oh Allah you are the most generous so please give me this one thing or a tawab Allah, you are the most ever pardoning. You love to pardon, so please pardon me. Or the provider of azaq Allah, you are the provider. Provide me with a halal income, or provide me with halal money, or provide me with this car or this house or this, whatever it may be. And I love this one, a shakur, the most appreciative. Allah, you are the most appreciative. So please appreciate this thing that I've done. You know, put this in my scale. Because I did it for you, Ya Rabbi, the most appreciative. Allah has so many names. Like, we don't study His names enough, by the way. That's something I wanted to get to um, another time. But Allah's names are not only a representation of who Allah is, but when you start to know who Allah is, you live life a little differently. So if you haven't done so, start to learn just a couple. Because they, they are... They, when you learn them and you understand them deeply, they're going to change your life. I don't know how to explain it. But again, that will be another episode. Gosh, I make too many episodes in one episode. And then you're going to ask Allah everything you want. After you praise Allah and you ask Allah by His names, ask for every single thing that you want. Don't hold back. Don't be shy. I talked about this. Don't think that Allah will not give you the thing that you're asking for. You know, again, with halal bounds. Ask Allah. Go crazy. Go nuts. Go bazonkers. Don't hold back, really. Allah is the most powerful, can do anything on the face of the earth, on the face of the universe, in the heavens, in the skies. Ask Allah anything. And then one beautiful thing, one extra layer that you can add, is to not only make da'a for yourself and, you know, everything that you want, but to make da'a for people in general. For the Ummah, for your friends and family, for people, for Muslims, for non-Muslims, make du'a. Like for ev- like you know how Oprah is like, you get a car, you get a car, you get a du'a is like that, but so much better. You know, like Allah may you grant all of the Muslims ease in this time. And then Allah is like, okay, I will answer that. And then you know you get. A good deed for every single Muslim that benefited from that. Because there was what, like 2 billion Muslims now? If you say, Allah, please, I want ease for all of the Muslims of this earth. Can you imagine how heavy that will weigh on your scale on the Day of Judgment? There's something so beautiful about us making da'a for all Muslims. And subhanAllah, we actually do that in our prayers without realizing it. We say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim laka anta al-hamid al-majid. O oh Allah, bless Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ala Muhammad. The world of Muhammad. We are the world of Muhammad. We are the ummah of Muhammad. We are the family of Muhammad. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in every prayer, in the five prayers, we are making dua for the ummah without realizing it. And there's actually a hadith that says, when you're making dua for another person, an angel comes and says, and for you the same. So if when you're asking, for example, for your friend to have an easy time during an examination, you say, oh Allah, make it be easy on them. Angel comes and says, for you the same. Allah, for them the same. Let them also have an examination that's easy. And you're just there praying for your friend without realizing that you're in the presence of an angel. Man, I love Islam. I just, I cannot stop talking about this stuff. It's just so beautiful. Every time I want to cry talking about this stuff, but I'm like, no, Farah, I should stop crying that much because I, I keep getting reposted while I'm crying. And I'm like, okay, I don't look like, like I, I'm okay. But I'm okay. But yes. Anyway. You guys get the gist. So like. Pray for yourself. And other people. And that's what we're doing all right now. We're praying for Palestine. Like our life depends on it. Because it does. It does depend on it. Uh, Al-Aqsa. And Palestine as a whole to us is so precious. And it's so deep embedded in our hearts. That it would almost be a crime if we didn't make da'a for their liberation and for our return all of our return to al-aqsa because every muslim has the right to go to al-aqsa and pray there at least once and the fact that you know what's happening is happening it should disturb every single muslim to be honest but alhamdulillah we're always making dua always 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 now i just gave you the simple etiquette and literally, I discussed so many things in this video. I hope it was comprehensive in any way. But never shy away from da'a. Never think that your da'a is too big for Allah, ever. Because that's not possible. Because what do we say at the end of the day? Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater. Allah is greater than your da'a. Allah is greater than everyone's da'a. Allah is greater than all of the greatest Ad'iyah combined. Every single dot that a person made, Allah is greater than all of those. So who, what makes you think that Allah is not going to answer you? So never shy away from that and keep making dot. It's such a beautiful thing and we're not taking advantage of it. Anyway, it's time for me to log out. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Have an amazing day. And I'll see you. Bye-bye.